Good evening. Uh, welcome to part two of our two-part series on calling, um, Faithfulness in the Present. Last month, we began part one of this series unpacking and defining the notion of calling um, and specifically examining it through a biblical lens um, to understand that calling is discerned through daily faithfulness. Now tonight, we'll be focusing on um, discerning our call as a communal aspect. Contrary to the individualist way we often think about calling, the Bible also presents um, a communal vision of the motivations that drive um, our calling. So David Kim, our executive director of the Center for Faith and Work, will expand on this tonight, but begin first um, with a brief recap from part one of our calling series. And his teaching will be followed by a Q&A. And the second half of our program consists of a panel discussion. Uh, we'll get a chance to hear from um, folks from various industries share their stories of how the calling has worked out in the day-to-day -day of their lives. And then you'll also be given time for individual reflection, followed by um, a group processing time where you'll engage with the folks at your table. Uh, we do have you seated specifically by industry group. Um, and after tonight's program, light refreshments will be served. We'll, um, food will be brought out to your table. So we do hope and encourage you to stay and continue conversations with one another. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Reverend David Kip to the stage. Great job. <laughs> um, great. It's great to be here with you all tonight. And it's exciting for me to address this topic of um, calling because especially tonight, because this idea of the communal nature of call is, I think, an, an aspect of call that is uh, seldom developed, even within the church context, but especially out in um, what I would call the, the larger secular context of trying to figure out what job you should be taking. And let me just start off by giving a brief recap of some of the points that we went through last time that I think will be important to build off of, at least as we try to understand the communal aspect of call. And I just want to make clear um, that calling is not about finding the perfect job or the most prosperous you. Okay? It's, calling is not about finding uh, what you're most passionate about. Calling is not even fundamentally about what you've been created to do. Um, and we have placed too much emphasis on these topics. And not to say that calling doesn't address these kind of issues and questions, but when we kind of forget what calling is fundamentally about we kind of lose the big picture of what we're supposed to discern. And calling highlights the fact that we have been created as beings that are able to respond to a caller. So that calling is first and foremost about the caller than it is about the content of the calling. And that's really critical to set the stage in understanding then how it is we discern things like call because we have a God who speaks to us. When we look at Ephesians 4.1, uh, Paul writes, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. He uses uh, in this opening of this letter this idea of calling twice. And he underscores the fact that God has called out to his people, both in Genesis 1 in creation, but also in recreation. He continues to call out to his people. And when you look at Ephesians 1, you'll notice that there are two kinds of callings, and that's the, the two ways that I try to um, summarize the biblical notion of call, that they could be broken out into two aspects, uh, one in general and one particular. And the general call corresponds to this idea of who we are in Christ, and the particular call corresponds to what we do. And last time I showed this uh, diagram to summarize um, the, the vast amounts of content when you look at scripture pertaining to this notion of calling. And what I try to highlight is the fact that uh, the Christian notion of calling, and I want to be clear, I am operating out of a, a Christian biblical framework here. I know that the ideas and notion of calling uh, have a lot more meaning, especially outside of the biblical framework. But I want to make clear what I'm addressing here is uh, what I would consider a unique gospel-centered approach to calling. And when we look at the diagram here, you notice on the left-hand side, who we are in Christ has to flow into what we do day to day. And it's in the context of those overlapping circles that we begin to discern what our calling is. That in some ways, if all you think of calling to be is what am I supposed to do with my life, 
In a matter of speaking, it doesn't matter from God's perspective what you're doing because you're not going to be able to, to discern what he wants you to be doing. And so every quest that we take to find that perfect job, in some ways, uh, God's call is falling on deaf ears. But then there's the other mistake of there are those who really understand what it means to be a disciple of Christ, what it means to be a child of God, but we're not asking the questions of how does that break into day-to-day -day life? How does that break into the details of what I do day in and day out in my profession, not only in the context of my motivations for the work, but also how I relate to my coworkers as well as the, the nature of the work itself? And this is where I think uh, when the church brings these two elements of the general call and the particular call together, you, you begin to experience something very powerful in the, in the context of how the gospel is able to change all things. And, and today I want to start by thinking through, given this framework, let me go back one, given this framework of the general and the particular call, how does this idea of community factor into the way we think about call as well as discern our calling? And part of beginning to address this issue is we have to understand that we have some significant blind spots when it comes to this idea of the communal nature of our calling. Because for those of us who grew up in the West, we come from centuries of a particular philosophical and cultural air that has, in some ways, um, we have breathed in the larger culture of individualism. And we see ourselves essentially as individual people. But when you look at some of the philosophical currents in the last two centuries, uh, there was this one particular philosophy that was called personalism. This is um, uh, described by a uh, sociologist at Notre Dame. His name is Christian Smith. And I took this um, quote from his book, What is a Person? And in this context, he was talking about uh, this kind of clashing between individualism and personalism. And I think this quote will help you understand the differences between the two. He writes, European personalism sought to offer an alternative to the liberal individualism that had transformed Europe during the 18th and 19th centuries by emphasizing the person over the individual and community solidarity over atomization. Indeed, personalism insists on speaking of people as persons instead of individuals because the former involves natural social ties and obligations, while the latter suggests atomistic autonomy. It's a really powerful quote because it, he talks about the fact that personalism began to decline pretty significantly in Europe because of uh, Hitler's Nazism and some of the philosophies that undergirded that particular movement, as well as in, in the United States. That personalism really began to die out pretty significantly, and as we all know, what became the thing that, that floated to the top was this idea of individualism that we are kind of islands to ourselves. And in order to find out who you are and what you're meant to do, you really have to look inward. But what Smith focuses on here is this idea that if you don't see yourself as an individual, but you see yourself as a person, you can't help but to understand yourself without, let me rephrase that, you can't understand yourself without other people. Because by definition of being a person, it requires community to be able to understand who you are. You see, the problem of reductionistic, uh, that reductionistic thinking of an individual is that it begins to identify constitutive elements of who you are, but in that process, you lose the fullness of the whole person. There's something about a human being, when you take out community, that that person actually is less of a human being as a result of that. I mean, we experience that in little ways here and there, but at least in a, from a philosophical perspective, we either have to start with the um, foundation that we are individuals, or we have to start off with the foundation that we are persons uh, by which we can only understand ourselves and our sense of what we are called to do through other people as well as by looking inward. Again, I'm going to have a time for Q&A after this, um, and please feel free to dive in because this is a rich uh, topic uh, but I want to offer, I think, what some of the problems are when we begin to approach calling from an individualistic perspective and not from a personal perspective. And um, he uses this illustration that when you think of water, typically when you see a fire, the first thing you, you, you do, if it's not a grease fire, is you pour water on it. But he talks about water, the constitutive elements of um, hydrogen and oxygen. 
that if you were to take those individual components and place either of them on fire, it would only accelerate the fire. It's only in this unique way that when they come together to create this new compound, that water takes on all new properties. New physics are involved. It's a whole other order of, um, of existence, in a matter of speaking, than just the constitutive element. And another way of saying that is the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And that's very true for human beings when we think about the nature of calling. That when you think of calling only from an atomistic, individualistic sense, you have a very reductionistic view of what it means to be called by God. And whatever decisions you end up making don't feel satisfying as a result of that. But when we begin to understand who we are as people created in the image of God, you begin to understand when community becomes a factor into the way I think about calling, all of a sudden you start to understand calling in a way that I think brings a deeper level of uh, not only satisfaction but resonance with who we are as people created in God's very image. And so all that to say, I think we need to push back significantly on this question of what is my calling and begin to understand it from this biblical lens of what it means to be called within the context of community. And to go deeper now into what does that look like, I want to um, look at a particular, uh, a few passages actually in Scripture. And I want to start off theologically and then dive in uh, more carefully to particular passages. But um, going back to the framework of what is calling, and if calling is first and foremost about the caller, we see in Scripture that we have a God the God who calls is a triune being. And hopefully this is not news to you, that when you look at the, the doctrine of God in Scripture, you have three persons, one God. And so ultimate reality, if God is the creator of everything, ultimate reality is three persons, one God. That there is something so fundamental about community that it can't be considered ancillary to our lives in the way that oftentimes when we think about calling uh, community becomes ancillary. But I want to point out from the very beginning, if we have a God, if the God who calls himself is community, that has to factor in significantly in the way that we think about how we respond to that call. Another way of saying this is, if God who is community calls to us, it is virtually impossible for us to get the fullness of that call as an individual. It requires community to be able to pick up on all the richness of what that call entails in our lives. And God, because of his, his triune nature, he's able to speak to us through a myriad of ways, primarily through, through Scripture, as Scripture communicates to clar in clarity who he is and how he communicates. But God's voice is also communicated through nature, through other human beings, through circumstances. But how do you begin to decipher all the ways in which God speaks unless we also have our community to support us in being able to discern these voices? Now, that's the God who calls. And, uh, the second part I want to talk about is then, how does community factor into this idea of the general call? Um, and this is where I want to dive into some of these verses just for a brief moment here. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 9, Peter writes, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. When Peter talks about this language of being called, who called you out of darkness, he's talking again about uh, this general call, who you are in Christ. And this who you are is clearly communicated as a plurality, as a community. And it's a special community. It's a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And these are different ways of describing, again, the unique aspect of being called in community. Romans 12.5, Paul writes this, So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members, uh, members of one another. Paul's writing here that he recognizes there are individuals, but when we come together, we are individuals among many. Uh, we are one body in Christ. And both of these passages help communicate that when we think of who we are in Christ, in our identity, we can never divorce that from community. We are called to community and we are irreducibly communal beings. Right? You cannot reduce ourselves as individuals, at least from a biblical standpoint. The second set of passages I want to address um, Focus now on our particular call in terms of what we are called to do 
in the gospel. And after I go through some of these biblical passages, I want to talk lastly about the implications of these passages with respect to our calling. Uh, the first passage here within uh, the particular call, Paul writes in Colossians 3.13, bearing with one another and and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you, you also must forgive. And then Hebrews, And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as it is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Both of these passages, so much of Scripture and the admonitions that uh, the New Testament writers in particular give are directed to how, that, how the call of the gospel, who we are, works out in the details of how we relate to one another. And the church has always set this standard that when you deal with another, especially those who are uh, professing believers in Christ, that there is a standard that you treat the other as if they were family. And that was, um, in, in many respects, a, an incredible innovation with respect to thinking about community. Because for most of human history, the only people that you could really trust were your blood relatives. And in the gospel, this idea, uh, this idea of community becomes so strong, and how it works out in the particulars of our lives becomes so distinct that when you looked at another person, even if that person were from a, another class, another sex, another socioeconomic uh, a different socioeconomic class, they were still considered family. And that was revolutionary. This was one of the reasons why the church grew so distinctively uh, in that first century era. And when you think about so much of the admonition that the New Testament gives with respect to what we are called to do in the day-to-day, is really about how to treat one another as human beings. So if I were to summarize the nature of uh, community in, in the particular call, it's placing a focus on other people in a way that I think our society often um, will, at best, will just instrument, instrumentalize others for the sake of our own benefit. And this idea of seeing other people as people, a.k.a. family members, is really at the heart of this communal aspect of the particular call. Now, let me talk... Um, and one more passage I want to bring up, the Ephesians 1, which we started with, but I want to give a, a little bit more context here. Uh, Paul writes again here, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling, again, general call, to which you have been called, the particular call, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. That's, again, the outworking of the particular call. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, and Paul, it's very important here that Paul, he knows he's addressing the plurality of the church, but in this plurality, he's emphasizing, just as you were called, to the one hope that belongs to your call. That's going to be important as we work out some of the implications. But he's saying, as you have been called as one body, there is one hope that is essential to the nature of the calling you have received with respect to the particular call. So I'm going to come back to that in a moment, but I just wanted to highlight uh, the importance of that phrase, one hope that belongs to your call. So, oops, nope. Um, let me now move to the final portion and talk about, well, we went through a whole series of verses here. Now tell me, how, what are the implications of these verses with respect to call then? And the first one I want to bring out is uh, this... Uh, this idea of community, who we are as people created in the image of God, you have to actively invite others to speak into your life to remind you of who you are and what you have been called to do versus simply looking within yourself to find these answers. A lot of times, especially in our culture today, you hire people to do that for you, right? You hire the, the coach, you hire the career counselor to kind of help you explore yourself. And there's nothing wrong with that. But at the same time, when we think about the communal nature of who you are, that's insufficient to give you a clear sense of who you are and your calling. You have to involve people who know you and care for you well enough to be able to be that voice. And it begins to beg a larger question that if I've designed my life in such a way that I don't have those kind of people in my life, there's something even more fundamental that, that we have to address that we have forgotten, again, this idea of the way the general call works in the particulars of loving other people. 
such that we haven't loved people around us in a way that they're able to and willing to speak into our own lives. And so that's going to be really important. How do we actively invite others to speak into your life so that as you go through the ups and downs of life, that there is people that you can always turn to over the course of time to help, again, remind you of who you are in Christ and what you are called to do. Secondly, a second implication here is we don't instrumentalize people for the sake of personal advance and gain, uh, but we look to them as people that we have been called to serve and love. So much of how we think about others, especially in the workplace context, not so much with friendships and family members, but this can certainly bleed into those areas as well. But when when it comes to your coworkers, think about the people that you work with. The default status of our hearts and our minds and the way that we look at them is we instrumentalize them in terms of how can they help me get to where I need to be. I mean, you want to be nice and you want to be kind and be a decent human being to them. But at the end of the day, when we look at our hearts, we essentially just see them as kind of a means to an end. I think that's part of the way that the work culture has trained us to think. But when we think again about the communal nature of who we are and the way that that works out and what we do, it has to radically change the way we view people from instrumentalizing them to actually being the the expression of the particular aspects of our call. In some ways, another way of saying this, the people around you are part of your call. They're not incidental to your call. They are part of your call. Remember the way the passages that we read in, in Colossians and Hebrews, and a lot of people say, well, that, that's Paul talking to the church. But remember, he, he is talking to the church, but he first talks to the church so that we begin to experience within the family of God, how do we be gracious to each other? How do we love one another? So that when he calls us out into the world, that we do the things that we have hopefully practiced well within our own family. Uh, when Paul, uh, Paul writes, you know, bearing with one another, if one has a complaint another, uh, against another, forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive. These basic things that what if you took this into the workplace? What if you were a person that was genuinely able to forgive something that your coworker did against you versus just kind of sweeping it under the rug or waiting for a later time to kind of get them back? And that would radically change the way that we consider uh, what it means to be a Christian called into the workplace. Thirdly, it makes our work about our work and how it leads to the flourishing of communities for the common good. When we look at the communal nature of our call, it reminds us that it's not that we as an individual have been called to a particular profession or a particular company, but that God has called a, a whole community of people. He calls a community of people because he has an end goal in mind. And this is what he talked about in Ephesians 4, 1, 6. Um, Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, there is a universal vision of God renewing all things in our world. And every person that belongs to Christ and the way the Spirit is also able to use people who are not necessarily in Christ towards that same goal, that that is a communal vision that helps us understand that our work is not so much about us and our self-fulfillment, but it's about the work itself. How do we do our work in such a way that makes our work be a blessing and that understands how our work fits into the fabric of our larger society and the way that that brings uh, a general good or a common good into our world? I think this also really pushes back against our ego uh, when we start to think of our work being fundamentally about ourselves in establishing our sense of security in establishing our sense of worth in establishing our sense of purpose. When we look at this kind of communal vision and that communal hope, that one hope that belongs to our call, we realize that our work is about our work and not ultimately about ourselves. And lastly, uh, the fourth implication here, um, it gives us a greater hope for our work than what we often experience day to day because of the future hope that awaits us. Going back to this uh, passage in Ephesians about this one hope that belongs to your call, as well as the Hebrews 10 passage, when the author of Hebrews says, and all the more as you see the day drawing near, you'll you'll see in the ESV, um, the English Standard Version of the text here, that day is the capital word D. And there is something very specific in mind. Basically, when Christ returns, 
there's a sense that he is going to make all things right. And when we understand that that is a communal hope, that is a communal sense of our call, it allows us to look beyond the brokenness of our industry in the present day. And it brings into our lives a hope that begins to sprout. Because some of us are in professions that are extremely difficult. What you encounter day in and day out is very inhumane. It it pushes against the fabric of what it means to be um, a person. And when you're in a context like this, it's very easy to lose hope in the sense of what am I doing here? There's nothing really to be redeemed because it is so broken beyond repair. And when we begin to understand, again, the communal nature of our call, it focuses us outward. And it begins to help us anchor our hope, not in what we see in the moment, but what, we're, what our faith allows us to see uh, with the return of Christ. And this is, again, something that you need community to help you see because the day-to-day experience of brokenness can often push away our sense of faith and seeing what's unseen. But when you have community around you that helps you see again that this is one day going to be cured, this is one day going to be healed, there is an ability to persevere in the work that you've been called to do. So I've kind of mentioned a lot, and um, I hope this is more about kind of a bit of a tease of kind of different ideas and concepts to get your minds kind of going. And so I want to transition now to the Q&A time. 